Thank you for being with us today. We would love to have you join us in person. To partner with us or to give online, go to www.upperroomohio.com. We hope you enjoy this message. Good to be with you guys today. I've asked Matt to come up. Matt's going to lead us through this portion. Hello, everybody. Hey, uh, we, we want to extend a, a very special Happy Veterans Day to anybody who has served in our military or are currently serving. So if you could stand up for us, any veterans. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts, and uh, we want to just in a second pledge allegiance to the flag, but I love how it says, you know, under, under God, un, individed, so, you know, it says we won't be divided, so as you, just would you stand with me, we're going to pledge allegiance to the flag. Pledge allegiance. Turn it over to another veteran. And we know the Navy's the way to go, yes, right? Yes, the Navy's the way right? to go. Got any Navy folks in here? All right. Yeah. Hey, it's good to see you. So, uh, all right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Well, glad to be here with you. I love what uh, Angie, don't you just love what uh, how the transition that Angie did today? Isn't that just really great? Just super. And uh, just the band, I mean, I mean, it's just amazing. I don't, I don't get to always come to Upper Room every time, but every time I've just been noticing, man, it just seems like things are just ramping up. It just seems like there's something going on in the spirit that's a little bit deeper. But uh, I love what she had to say about the Lord fighting our battles. And what happened to me on Monday was really interesting. Sometimes I wake up in the morning. Most of the times I have a song in my head. So I'll be get a song that'll be just going through my head and I get up and I start singing that song to start my day. But on Monday, I had a, a, a impression that basically that God was going to fight my battles. I mean, it was really that strong. I'm, I'm with you. I'm going to fight your battles. And, and uh, I have one of my favorite verses is out of Joshua 1.9, to be very strong and courageous. He's commanded me to be very strong and courageous for the Lord God is with me wherever I go. So I didn't know what that was going to look like, and so I went through my day doing what I do. And then all of a sudden, about four o'clock, I had to go to a, to some place where I needed to be. And in the middle of me going to the place where I needed to be, I had a battle. I found myself right in the middle of a battle. Has anybody ever experienced that? Like you weren't planning on being in a battle, but suddenly you're in a battle. And verbal battles. Do y'all like verbal battles? Those are really exciting. Verbal battles. But anyway, and then have you, anybody ever had question battles where people just fire questions at you? Like, doo, 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 doo. anybody ever have that happen? You know, and uh, I freak out like that. My wife asks a lot of questions, and she knows she knows by now just 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 you know because I'm an internal processor. I get too many questions, it's like my brain just gets short circuited because I can't internally process 15 questions in once. So that's kind of where I'm at. So anyway, I was having all this stuff being fired at me, and because of the morning, realizing that the Lord was fighting my battle, I just took a deep breath in the middle of the battle. My mouth did get dry. I don't know if you guys ever have that happen when you're trying to communicate and you're nervous and you're trying to say the right thing and be friendly and everything. So anyway, that happened, and then I went out and, and really had a great night helping the fire department win the levy in Trotwood, three to one, yes, to fire department, EMT. <laughs> So that happened, and that was very exciting. But it was interesting that Angie talked about that today because, you know, Jehoshaphat and Israel, they were really, really in trouble. I mean, they really were. You know, our eyes are, are on you. We don't know what to do. And so he, they were really seeking God, trying to find out what God's saying. And God, God spoke to Jehoshaphat and says, what I want you to do is I want you to go and stand, and I want you to stand there, and, and I will fight your battle. And so then there's a really obscure verse. If you look at the obscure, obscure verse, what, what it says this. It says, when he consulted with the people. Isn't that interesting? When he consulted with the people. In other words, he said this. He Something like this, probably. Hey, 
we're, we are stuck. We're in this really bad thing. I've been before the Lord. The Lord's spoken to me. And he told me if we go and if we just stand, that he will fight our battle and we will win the victory. So he consulted with the people. And it's really interesting that I believe what happened to the people says, well, if God says he's going to win the victory and all we have to do is going to go to stand, I think we should just praise him and give worship. I think we just should have a great, huge praise thing going on with loud shouts and cymbals and everything else. Let's just do that. What do you think? And so what happened, they go up, okay, they go up, and they say, okay, God, what we're going to do, we're going to stand, having done all to stand, stand firm, we're going to stand, and now, in response to what you said you're going to do, isn't that good? In response to what you said you were going to do, you were going to fight our battles and give us the victory, what else can we do but praise you? What else can we do but sing your song? What else can we do to dance and shout? What else can we do? And so they did, and what happened, as they began to sing, what happened? Boom. The battle was won. The battle was won. It's interesting, if you study Scripture, if you get dig into Scripture, I've done some study into this, but Ephesians chapter 6, what's it say in Ephesians chapter 6? It says you're supposed to clothe ourselves in the armor of God. Yeah. And then it says, it says this, stand, having done everything to do what? Stand. doesn't mean to punch the enemy up beside the face or any of that kind of stuff. What it says is, you're very standing, clothed in the armor of God, sure-footed, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, all that kind of stuff, always pushing forward, leaning into Jesus. What happens is the Lord fights the battle. Because we're clothed, not in our armor, but guess what? It's His armor. Did you know that the helmet of salvation is part of the armor of God? It's an offensive part of the armor. A lot of times we think it's defensive, but no, it's the offensive part of the armor. Why? Because if the enemy can put thoughts in your head, guess who's stronger than the enemy who can put better thoughts in your head? God can. Amen. That's the truth. Amen. And for a long time I was bound up because I thought every thought that came into my head, my head was my thought or the enemy's thought. And occasionally I would get God's thoughts. But then I began to pray. I went, oh, wait a minute. i got a helmet of salvation. That's an offensive weapon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on God's thoughts. Salvation. He saved me. I'm his son. So therefore, if I'm his son, he's my father. He's stronger than the enemy. So Father, I get up in the morning. Father, as I put this on, give me your thoughts today. Give me your thoughts today. And guess what happens? A lot of times I get God's thoughts. Get the other thoughts? They're really easy to discern now. Because if it ain't my thought, it ain't God's thought. Guess what I say? Ain't my thought. And it can be a really bad thought. I go, no, nope, not my thought. I'm sorry. God gives me good thoughts. So putting that, that, that helmet on... What it does in the midst of the battle, recognizing that God is for us and not against us. The Romans 8 says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. What we can do is we can come up and we can stand firm having done all to stand. But the cool thing about Veterans Day, the cool thing about Veterans Day is there were some people in the Bible, they were called centurions. Have you guys ever heard of a centurion? These were military guys. These were guys that were in a Roman army. The, the guy, uh, they, they were strong. Centurions were guys who basically what they did, they, they pr were promoted through the ranks. And they weren't just promoted because of their uh, battle uh, strength and experience in battle. What they were promoted for was because of their intelligence, their determination, and the determination or the soundness of their mind. That's what they look for. Loyalty, commitment, strength. Coming up through the ranks. In other words, developing relationships in the midst of them coming up into the ranks. And these centurions were people over hundreds. And sometimes they were over more than hundreds. And sometimes the centurions were giving spe given special missions. One centurion was given the special mi mission of guarding Paul. Remember Paul got arrested. He's in Rome. He's got a guy with him. Guess who that guy was? Centurion. Remember when Paul was on the boat? He's go going on the boat. He says, hey guys. We're all going to die if we, don't, if we don't do some stuff and we don't stay on the boat and, and, and trust God. Guess who was with him on the boat? A centurion. And the centurion guarded Paul. Right, here's how I think the armor of God came, came about. Here's how, how I believe it. I believe Paul has been hanging out with this guy called a centurion. And he looks at the centurion just like we look at stuff in the natural. And all of a sudden God starts speaking to Paul. Hey, Paul, did you know that uh, my armor has a helmet of salvation? Kind of like a centurion's. That uh, my, uh, my breastplate is a breastplate of righteousness, like a centurion of integrity. I have a girdle of truth, like centurion's wear. I have my feet 
shod with peace, just like the centurion's uh, feet were shod, was shod with special boots. Do you know the special boots? you know what they were for? It's for them to stand. Because what centurions and the Roman army did, they stood as one. They fought as one, and they won battles as one. So it wasn't just an independent sport. It was something that was very important. I believe that Paul basically uh, saw this in, uh, in, uh, in the centurion. There's one of them. Isn't that a cool guy? That's the centurion. It's kind of like Matt. I always think of Matt as a centurion. I was looking at all these pictures. I said, there's Matt. There's Matt. There's Matt. He's in all these pictures. He's a strong guy. Anyway, do you see that stick that he has? That is called the rod of authority. When a centurion walked around, guess what he did? He carried a big stick. <laughs> Have you ever heard that term? Yeah. yeah, that guy carries a big stick. Guess where they got that from? Roman centurions. But if you look at a Roman centurion, what do they have? They have a helmet with really cool feathers. And they had different divisions, and according to the division, they had different colors of feathers. And some were red feathers, some were red and black feathers, some were white feathers, some were white and blue feathers, all kinds of feathers, really cool. But that was a centurion, and uh, that's what he looked like. And that's where the armor of God, when Paul, can you imagine being around one of these guys all the time, communicating to him. At one time, he was chained to a centurion. Does that make sense? So there he is. There's another centurion uh, in, in the Bible. His name was Cornelius. Has anybody ever heard of Cornelius? Okay, Cornelius, he's a really cool guy. This is like cliff notes for uh, Acts chapter 10. I would encourage you all to go home and read the chapter of Acts chapter 10. I was going to read the whole thing today, but I'm just going to kind of give you cliff notes. So you can go home and read Acts chapter 10. Do you know why it's important you read Acts chapter 10? Are there any Gentiles in here? Can I see the hands of all the Gentiles, please? All the Gentiles, please raise your hand. Other people, or you're Jewish. or I guess you're Jewish. But anyway, up until Cornelius' time in Acts chapter 10, the gospel and the good news was only for Jewish people. But God looked down and he saw somebody that grabbed his heart. He was a military man. And it's said that about Cornelius, Cornelius had a heart toward God. As a matter of fact, Cornelius set aside time, special times to go and pray. He, he gave alms. He, he fasted. Can you believe that? He fasted. And he was a Roman. He was Roman. But he was a different kind of Roman because he, instead of having Roman paganism with all these gods, he was committed to one God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The other interesting thing about Cornelius is he had Jewish friends. He had Jewish friends, people he loved and, and cared for. And some people say that, that Cornelius is the same centurion found in another book that Luke wrote. It was called Luke. Acts, wrote, um, Acts was written by Luke, and Luke was written by Luke. A couple Lukes. So anyway, Luke, Luke writes about the centurion, and what the centurion there in the story, uh, Jesus gives an amazing, amazing analogy. He, he's talking to a group of people who came from this centurion's house, and these, two, these people who came to Jesus were Jewish people. They were part of his friend. They were, they were his friend's, friends group. They were friends with this certain centurion. And so they come to Jesus, and, and what, they, what he sent them to do was to plead for Jesus to come and heal his servant that he loved. That's different than, than a lot of ways we think about military people, but this guy, this centurion, loved people. He cared about his servant. He loved his servant. As a matter of fact, the reason why he sent two Jewish guys to talk to Jesus is because he's really smart. He's a non-Jew, so he's figuring, okay, if I'm going to get Jesus' attention, guess who I'm going to send? Jews. And so he sends Jews to talk to Jesus, and so they say, hey, Jesus, it says he, they pled with Jesus, Jesus, please, 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 please come and heal this guy's servant. He loves his servant. I mean, it would be bad news if this guy, guy dies, so please, Jesus. As a matter of fact, let me tell you about this centurion. This centurion loves us so much he gave everything for us. He loved us so much that he built a synagogue for us. Isn't that amazing? That's how much love that this centurion had for the Jewish people. It would be like this. Any military people here today that love the upper room? Anybody? Anybody here? Love the upper room? Thank you. Thank you, military people. I uh, see those hands. By the way, we're going to knock out this wall for growth, and it's going to go all the way back 
So would you guys please just pay for it? It's not going to happen, but I'm just giving you that illustration. That is how much this, this centurion loved the Jewish people. He built them a church building. And so Jesus says, okay, uh, I'll, I'll go with you guys. And so they start walking back to this centurion's house with the sixth servant. Uh, and all of a sudden, the centurion in the house sends runners to meet Jesus. And they come up to Jesus and they say to Jesus, Jesus, the centurion says this. Here's what he says. You don't even have to come to my house. I'm not worthy for you to come in my house. But one thing I do understand, I am a man of authority. And when I tell my servant to do this or one of my men to do this, my men does it. All you have to do, because you are under authority, is speak the word, and my servant will be made whole. And so what Jesus did, he spoke the word, and guess what happened to the servant? Boom. But this military man was then commended by Jesus. The military man was commended by Jesus because what Jesus said to him, what Jesus said, said to the, the runners who brought the message, and he stood back, and the crowds were following Jesus, he just stopped in his tracks, and he says, I've never seen such faith in all of Israel. Why? Because the centurion took Jesus at his word. That's a character trait of military people. They, are, they understand the chain of command. They understand that when a commander says, you do what the commander says. They understand this whole thing of sometimes not understanding what the commander is saying, to do what the commander says, because it it's going to make sense down the road somehow. Or maybe not, but I've still got to do it. <laughs> that makes sense. And sometimes, anybody ever had Jesus tell you to do stuff that doesn't make sense? Okay, anybody ever done that? The other day, I'm driving back. I just, I just had filmed, we just filmed, get this. We were able to film four key pastors in the African-American community on, for two and a half hours on Friday, talking about kindness and how kindness goes outside of their church into the community and draws people to Jesus. Two and a half hours of these guys. It was amazing. I sat there going, wow, wow. And I can't remember where I was going. What was that? I was driving. Oh, I was driving after that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's my wife. Driving, driving after that. So I'm driving back, and all of a sudden, the Lord speaks to me about going to a place I didn't really want to go to. I wanted to go home. I wanted, you know, two and a half hours, plus all the prep time and all that stuff, and driving to Cincinnati, you know, it's alone. You know, it's a long time. And so all of a sudden, I would say, okay, I'm going to go. I'm just going to go. So I drive to this place. I'm, I'm sitting there. And all of a sudden, I meet somebody who's, who goes here. And we had this wonderful talk about prophetic and talked about uh, prayer teams and all this kind of stuff. And, and then that, that person left. I'm still sitting there talking. And all of a sudden, I met a guy named Stephen. I thought, oh, that's cool. My name's Stephen. Met Stephen. So Stephen's sitting there. He says, hey, I was eavesdropping on what you guys were talking about. He says, I go to Redeemer Church just down here. Uh, down Fair, North Fairfield Road. And, and our church, is, uh, I said, well, what are you doing? He says, I'm studying Buddh Buddhism. I said, why are you studying Buddh Buddh Buddhism? He says, well, what I'm trying, however you say it, I'm trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out how to be able to communicate and speak to people in different religions so that we'll be prepared so when we do outreach, then what will happen is that we'll have uh, 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 enough uh, understanding to give an, give an account for what we believe. I said, that's awesome. I said, by the way, I'm an outreach guy. He goes, you really? I said, yeah, I'm an outreach guy. And so we had this really long talk, and I was encouraging him. I said, yeah, everybody begins where they are with what they have. And we had this really wonderful talk. And then before I left, before I left my house that day, I re for some reason, out of my garage, okay, you guys have garages, you know, and you got shelves, and some people clean them, and some people it's just there. Well, mine's kind of in the middle. I clean them, but most of it's just there. So I was out of my, my shit in my garage, and all of a sudden I noticed this DVD set for my friend, Doug Pollock, who wrote a book of, of God, called God Space. He's a friend of mine. And, and it's a DVD uh, school to tell people how to communicate the good news to people in the community. And so I'm sitting there with Stephen talking to him about this. I said, I said here's a couple of books you can read. God Space by Doug Pollock, great book in the externally focused church. 
by a guy named Rick Russo. He really figured, figured it out how to get churches out in the community to love people. Their churches exploded in Colorado. Everything's happening. And then I said to him, oh, by the way, I saw a DVD <laughs> series. And uh, Stephen, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you Doug Pollock's DVD series to help you to equip your church to be able to reach out to people. He goes, you do that for me? I said, yeah, man, I'll do that for you. And so I went home, and guess where the DVD series is right now? In my car. Why? Because I'm calling Stephen and saying, hey, I'm going to give you uh, this DVD series. Do you, uh, the point was, sometimes God asks you to go, and you haven't a clue why you're going there. Does that make sense? And we're all like that. And so what we're learning, you know, is just to listen to those little prompts and then to respond. And so I had, like, kind of reluctant obedience, you know, kind of dragging my feet. But you know what? God still showed up, and God still blessed people. Well, anyway, that's similar to what happened with Cornelius. He was a devout man, and what happened to him, he was worshiping, and all of a sudden, boom, an angel shows up. And then the angel's very, uh, uh, very specific, tells him to go down to Joppa, knock on the door, ask for Peter. So they begin to do that. He sends a crew down to go talk to to Joppa, go to talk to Peter. So as they're getting ready to knock on the door, Peter's hungry. He's upstairs sitting on a roof, and all of a sudden there is a, a sheep that comes down. There's a, there he is. That's Peter. Uh, and his sheep comes down, and all of a sudden it has all these animals in it. And, uh, and so Peter's looking at this, can't get it, what's going on. And God says, take and eat. And guess what Peter says? No, I ain't doing it. I've never had food in my mouth like that ever. I'm not eating bacon. It ain't happening. I'm not having a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich tomorrow. Thank you very much. So anyway, what happens is God wants to make a point, so he does this three times. I mean, talk about McFly, you know, like, hello. But reluctant Peter finally, oh, and then he's sitting there pondering. Can you imagine having a vision like that, saying, what in the world was that all about? I mean, what was that about? Oh, God just told me, wow, man, I get to eat anything. Then all of a sudden, at the same time that this is happening, Hey, hey, we're from, you know, Cornelius' house. He sent us here. We walked 12 hours. Here we are. We, you know, we're hanging out. We want Pito's come to talk to Peter. Peter hears this. His ears perk up, and he runs down the balcony and comes in and goes, Hey, I'm the guy that uh, you came looking for. What do you want? Well, here's what happened. Cornelius was in a place of prayer, and all of a sudden an angel showed up. And so the angel said, Hey, come and get Peter, because we need to hear what you got to say. And so, so here we are. And Peter goes, okay, come on in. Hang out in my house. So they just hung out. No telling what they talked about. Uh, Peter probably thought about sending out to the deli to get some really good, uh, so, uh, never mind. So Peter, <laughs> Peter, uh, and then they have a conversation. And they go back. They, they walk up to, okay, they walk all the way back. At, they we're talking like this is over a period of four days. They walk back. And all of a sudden they come to Corne uh, Cornelius' house. Look what happened to the centurion. What did he do? He's a man. He's a military man. But what did he do out of respect for Peter was it says he fell down in humility and began to worship Peter because he thought an angel told me to come see you, so you must be pretty important. And you know what Peter did in his humility? He says, dude, I put my pants on just the way you do. I'm a guy just like you. Why am I here? And so what happens is that uh, good old uh, Peter stands up and starts talking, begins to reason with Cornelius, begins to tell, tell Cor Cornelius about, about Jesus, begins to talk to him about who he was. And he says this, hey, Cornelius, you know about this stuff. That's what he says, Acts chapter 10. You know about this stuff. You know about Jesus, how he went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the enemy. You know about this guy. And all of a sudden, Cornelius, no tell what's going on. Cornelius, not only was it Cornelius, but Cornelius had his family there, and all of his friends were there. It's like a big crowd. And so anyway, Peter starts preaching the, the word concerning Jesus. I mean, he tells him everything about Jesus, how he came, what he was doing. He died on the cross, and then he rose again from the dead. And all of a sudden, boom, the Holy Spirit fell. And all of a sudden, all the non-Jewish people began to proclaim the good news in other languages and worship God. The Holy Ghost, boom, had the second outpouring 
And guess who it was upon? The Gentiles. Do you know why you're here? Because one military man decided to be dedicated to God. One military man who had a family decided that he would follow Jesus. And because he followed to God the best he knew how, Jesus invaded his life. They all got baptized. And the power of the Holy Spirit then not just went to Jewish people, but began to flow to all nations of the world through one guy, a military guy named Cornelius. I mean, somebody ought to say, shout amen or something. It's crazy. It's crazy. So you know why you're here? Because of this one with God's obedience. This man, his name was Cornelius, a military guy. And I just thought, you know, when Aaron asked me to, to, to uh, speak today, I, th I just thought, man, you know, I don't, I don't have anything to speak on. I have a canned message last year. But God spoke to me. He said, Centurion. That's all he said was Centurion. So I did research into Centurion, and I realized that there are some character traits that are in our military that are still, that were in, 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 uh, in that were uh, in uh, Cornelius. And it's not just men, it's women. It's, it's all the services. It's the whole smear of commitment that there's some character traits that are in them that only they know as deep as they know. And that's why we honor them today, because they only understand some of the things of these character traits in a way that they know it that we don't know it. Would you agree? Yeah. I agree. So here's some of the character traits. Authority. They understand authority. Would you agree? Probably far better than we do. Because they're men under authority. And so what they have to do is to respect authority and honor the authority. Probably, sometimes, even a commander-in-chief that they probably might not even disagree with. That probably might disagree with. But they understand one thing. They have marching orders, and they're going to do what the authorities tell them to do. I remember one time I was, I was in the Navy, and I'm standing there. I'm like, this, I was going to bring a picture, and you would, you would have said, how did a 16-year-old kid get in the Navy? But anyway, I remember they're standing, you know, and I was a little rebellious, and the chief comes by. And back there in, in Vietnam era, I had like a mustache. You could have mustaches. No hair, but you could have a mustache, you know. And we would hide our hair under our, our hats because it's all hippies and stuff. So I'm standing there, and he comes by and he says, Bowen, I want you to trim up that mustache, Bowen. You understand me? I said, Yes, sir. And he walked away, and he came, stood up, and he said, uh, Is there any questions? And suddenly I, my hand went up. I don't, I don't know why my hand went up, but it, it just kind of kind of went up. He said, what is it, Bowen? I said, sir, do you happen to have a razor? <laughs> Whoa! I got nailed, man. I mean, he was, I mean, he was in my face. And, yes, sir, yes, sir. I don't know why I said that, sir. Yes, sir, yes, sir. I'm going right now. Boom, out, out the door I went. <laughs> but you see, they understood, they understand authority. That's where it comes. The other thing to understand is they understand trust. Trust like we don't understand it. They trust people for their very lives. Men and women in military and a police force and fire department, they trust people deeply. Why? Because their very lives depend upon it. If you don't trust somebody, man, it's really hard to go to war. If you don't trust somebody, it's really hard to, to you know, to, to not always be looking over your shoulder. And so they understand trust far deeper than do family. They understand the importance of family. And I believe that every military man and woman, when they got married, they understood family. We need family. But you know what comes under the most stress in the military? is family. Why is that? Because there's some insecurities that are going on. He's being stationed for six months here and back here. They, we don't know where we're going to live. We live for three years, and then we move on, and we go over here for three years, and then we go over here for four years. And it's really great when you can get a big length of duty near each other for a long time. It's really great. But then there's stresses, it's e economic stresses. If, 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 it, if one of the persons have been in, in combat, then they come back with, you can imagine, some stresses and some things going on in their lives that really stresses family, but they understand family. And they understand the value of family, and, and I believe that every, every military family 
understands that even though sometimes there's cracks that happen because of uh, undue stresses that we couldn't even understand. They understand sacrifice. They understand commitment. They understand this whole thing of determination. And that's one of the reasons why they would, they would, they would get uh, centurions to do what they needed them to do is because those were the ones who, ha who were proven to have a sound mind of determination. In other words, they did a great in everything, but they had this mind that was, was determined to be able to carry out and to understand how to take care of their troops and to prepare them for war. And then the last couple of things that they had, they had was readiness. Now, they understand readiness, readiness far, far better than we understand readiness. They have to be ready to go in a moment's notice, many, many, many military men and women. And the other night, I thought I was ready. I told Patty, I said, man, I'm ready. And uh, so what happened, we had a power outage, and I thought to myself, I'm ready. Where's my, where's my thousand lumen lamp? When I turn it on, it lights up the whole, whole room. Where is that? So I'm sitting here thinking, I'm ready. Where's it? Where is it? Oh, I was working on the furnace. So where is it? Oh, it's next to the furnace, pitch black. So I have to go through the kitchen to trip over the clothes basket to move the broom and the dustpan to get to the garbage, to move the garbage pan, to move the buckets to get to my 1,000 lumen lamp. And I turned it on and said, I was ready. <laughs> but was I really ready? I wasn't ready, was I? I, had, I, wasn't, I wasn't as ready as, as, people, as people in the military. The, the last thing that I think that happens that, that military people understand, I think just a little bit uh, better than we understand, is this whole thing of joy, of camaraderie. There's a joy in camaraderie. There's some humor that is really joyful that only they understand. Believe me, I was with Matt and a bunch of firemen at a retreat. I said, man, their humor is really amazing. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> But you know what I mean, but there's a joy in there, and the reason why there's joy and why these crazy jokes, they do all this stuff because the stresses are so high. And so there has to be a stress releaser, and so they understand what it means to have fun when you can, and to have joy and make light of some things, because sometimes it's not light. You understand? So that's what they are. On Veterans Day, is a special day for us here at uh, the Upper Room, and uh, we really do want to say thank you. Uh, to you and your families. It's not something uh, that's apart from us. It's part of the tradition of Upper Room. And the other thing I want to encourage, encourage you to the military here and services people is that God loves the military. He loves you in the midst of it. He picked a man to change the world who was in the military. God loved him because he, he was a soldier and he, he understood some principles. And the reason why God chose Cornelius is because Cornelius, number one, had a heart after God. And we understand that if you're here at the upper room, you too have a heart after God. And we want to honor that heart. We want to say thank you very much for what you're doing for the upper room and more than that, what you've done for our country. So would all the veterans just please stand up? Would you guys just please stand? All vets, just stand up. That's just so super. That's so super. And then if you have family, would your families just stand? If you have family with you, just let your family stand with you. That's so good. It's awesome. Okay, the rest of us, let's give it up. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Woo! Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if everybody can sit down, except for the vets, if you guys could stay standing, that'd be really great. <laughs> so this is going to be an up-down day. But anyway, one of the, one, what we, well, I was praying this week, and I, I was in here, and I really I had, a pic, I had pictures of people standing in certain spots. And I saw a family of people gathered around and just praying for you as a family. And so if, if you're uncomfortable with that, you know, you're uncomfortable with people praying for you because I understand that, that that's just, you know, too many people around could, could affect you. If that's you, you can have a seat just now with, with no, nothing going, no, no issue. You can just do that. But for the rest of these guys who are standing, okay, upper room family, jump up.
gather around them, just begin to pour life into them, just strengthen them, pray for them, bless them, encourage them, pour into them, and thank them for their service. Thank them for their service. Why don't we just stand and give Jesus a big hand for today? Can we do that? 